And the prophet Isaiah's words call us into worship together, saying, the God who created. The God who formed. The God who redeemed. Has called us by name. As the people of God. As we gather in this place, called by name to be here, the people of God, we rise and gather in worship, singing the song, Gracious God, You Call Your People. Come, let us praise God together. God greets us and welcomes us to this place with these wonderful words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Please take a moment to share Christ's peace with those gathered around you in worship this morning. As we enter into God's presence, we recognize that we do not uh, live according to the way that God calls us to live. And so we find this need to come clean 
through a prayer of confession. This morning we do that through a song of confession that will be led by the worship team. Uh, there will be singing, we'll sing two verses together. There'll be a musical interlude, interlude for a time of silence for us to offer our personal prayers of confession. And then we'll sing verse three together, uh, rising as we sing uh, the third verse of before the throne of God above. Let's confess our sin. Christ, you are forgiven people. Go forth to live in that peace. Amen. Prepare our hearts to hear God's word this morning by singing that song we've been singing throughout this sermon series on Galatians. Teach us your ways. We'll remain standing as we sing.
us your ways, O oh God, that we may learn from you, that we may give to one another, that we, we may weep with one another, that we may even learn from one another in Christ. That is our prayer this morning. And together, all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So this is it. This is the end, the final sermon in our series on Paul's letter to the Galatian church, which was really, if you remember, a smattering of little churches that made up the church in Galatia, churches full of mostly Gentile, that means non-Jewish, uncircumcised Christians. And you remember, of course, that Paul himself a Jew by birth, education, training, and tradition, a devoted follower of the law, the Torah, what we know as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This Paul became a follower of Jesus, freed from the expectations and the judgment of all those laws. And he became a fervent missionary who wound up in Galatia on a prolonged stay. So he had plenty of time to tell the Galatians about the good news of Jesus. And this good news, of course, was, is, that Jesus is God's fulfillment of that long ago one promise of blessing. First experienced and proclaimed over Abraham, Sarah, and their son, and then their offspring through every generation, and then all the peoples on the earth. In other words, Paul told the Galatians, while he was with them, that it was not because of circumcision or law that they were enfolded into God's for everyone born grace. No, it was Jesus, just Jesus who did that. Just Jesus who enfolded them into the family, adding to the diversity of God's one united family tree. So that's what Paul told them while he was there. He, of course, went away to help other churches, and he had to repeat that same message all again in this letter because those missionaries came, right? They came after he left with that yes, but addendum Jesus, birth, life, death, resurrection, brings you into God's one promised blessing, but you still have to follow the law they taught. Now, this message, this letter of Paul, not originally intended for us, it speaks to us, reminding us that Through one gospel, one call, one table, one promise, one hope, we are one in Christ too. Called to be united witnesses of Christ in the world too. And so we wrap it up today. We wrap it up with a very short section that serves for Paul and his letter as a brief introduction to a longer conclusion. What New Testament scholar Charles Kussar calls a distinct phase of the letter as it shifts from defending or explaining the gospel into an explanation of how this gospel impacts the Galatian Christians' relationship with one another, answering the question, if this one gospel is true for us, then how are we to live with one another? So let's listen. Let's listen to this brief intro into the letter's conclusion from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only your freedom is not an opportunity for your self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this morning, this morning, I thought we could stand to start with a little cuteness. So I would like you to meet Abby. Abby is a toddler with a problem. 
What's wrong, Abby? What's wrong, baby? <laughs> Let go of the door. Let go of the door. Here. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was too adorable, right? And it was quick, so I think it's worth watching one more time. Let's watch it again, Megan. What's wrong, Abby? What's wrong, baby? <laughs> Let go of the door. Let go of the door. Here. <laughs> Makes me laugh every time. I've watched it a lot. Abby found herself, right, stuck between the cupboard she was sitting on and the cupboard door. She was stuck in between. And you're probably going to think I've lost the plot when I tell you that Abby's problem, her dilemma, is just about the perfect metaphor for the problem that Paul finds the Galatian Christians dealing with, a people stuck in between. Because sure, we've spent six weeks focusing in on those missionaries to quote Paul who were perverting the gospel of God's for everyone born grace in Jesus by including addendums to that grace. It's grace, kind of, but it's also the law and circumcision. And week after week, we've heard about the impact of the Galatian churches as many were falling for it. Many were beginning to believe that Christ wasn't enough. Circumcision was necessary, and especially following all the right laws, rules, traditions was necessary to be included in God's one promise, God's one family, to earn, you might say, God's love. For six weeks, we've heard how Paul spent almost every spare word, phrase, sentence, period of this letter countering the message of these addendum-adding, law-bound, legalist Christian missionaries, reminding the Galatian Christians that Jesus was enough. Just Jesus freed them from all the obligations of the law. Just Jesus was the fulfillment of God's one promise to bless all the peoples of the earth. But guess what? That wasn't actually the only issue that the Christians of the Galatian churches were dealing with. We find that out now, here, towards the end, Paul tells us. Those addendum-adding legalist Christian missionaries weren't the only voices whispering messages contrary to God's one gospel into the ears and swaying their hearts and minds. You see, while those voices of legalism were whispering into one ear, different voices were whispering into the other. Voices that some scholars call the libertine Christians. They propose that these libertines, perhaps you hear the word liberty in there, had heard Paul preaching about Jesus. They had heard about how the for everyone born grace of God in Jesus freed everyone from being bound to the law. And then they honed in on those words, free, freed, freedom. Now, freedom is a hot word in our day and age too, right? We hone in on it too, especially the last few years where a Harris Purple Project poll found that 92% of U.S. citizens fear Their personal freedom is under siege. And of course, political strategists and lobbyists have been ramping up that threat-based language. And so we hear about freedom a lot. A sure way for politicians to rile up a base or sling accusations at an opponent is to accuse the other side of trying to take away personal freedom, restrict individual rights. Because, as Webster's Dictionary reminds us, our most accepted understanding of freedom is an individual's right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. So we have that in common with those first century Galatians. Because some who heard Paul's message about Jesus and freedom and grace understood freedom from the law, the Torah, much the same way. 
The freedom from the law that Jesus gave was for personal liberty, for self-interest, for each person's right to act, speak, or think in the best interest of what felt good or was good for the individual self. So in the absence of Paul's one gospel message of grace, the Galatian church was pulled and divided between the legalist Christians who were focused on their list of laws, rules, and expectations, and the libertine Christians who were focused on their individual self-indulgent freedom. And this divide was leading to a biting, a devouring, a disregard for their neighbor, for one another. So, to a people, a church, stuck in between, excluding legalism and self-interested liberty, Paul offers a third way, writing, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only your freedom is not an opportunity for your self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. Hear those words again. Only your freedom is not for your self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. Paul. Paul seems to be implying that Christian freedom leads to slavery. And that's not a translation error. Paul basically wrote, you are not free so you can satisfy yourself. Your freedom lets you become slaves to one another through love. Paul clearly does not understand freedom at all, at least not the kind of freedom that most likely comes to mind for us, a, a people steeped in freedom talk. So Paul either doesn't understand the concept of freedom or freedom is supposed to mean something completely different to followers of Jesus. And spoiler alert, it's the second one. For Paul, for the entire New Testament witness for Jesus, the freedom Jesus came to offer us doesn't have anything to do with individual rights or personal liberty or self-interest or self-indulgence. All of Paul's freedom talk is not a battle cry to individual, defend at all costs, freedom that some pretend it is or wish it was. Rather, Paul says that freedom from the law Jesus gives us in love lets us become slaves to one another through love. Then Paul uses the rest of his letter to describe in deeper detail what this looks like in our relationships with one another, calling out any action rooted in self-interest and indulgence while emphasizing the work of the Spirit and mutual help and bearing burdens and working for the good of all. But it all begins with this introduction to the conclusion, with the implication that Christian freedom leads us to slavery. Only your freedom is not for your own self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. Now, truth be told, out of caution over the connotation of slavery and what it implies, many of our English translations use the words become servants here to soften it a little bit. And how do I understand that impulse? For that reason, and also because too often scripture is used to justify abuse and domination. Scripture is often used to keep people in unsafe degrading situations too often. And especially Paul's words are often used this way because they are taken out of context of mutual life-giving relationships. So I would certainly be much more comfortable reading, but through love become servants to one another so that there's no misunderstanding rather than, but through love become enslaved to one another. But the word slavery is purposeful. Enslaved, this word is purposeful. Paul intended first century Christians, that audience, to hear 
what they already knew about slaves. You see, slaves, they knew, served their masters without questioning the legitimacy of their masters. They served them without a litmus test to determine if their master was worthy. They served them without a check and balance system to determine if their master was worth following and serving and um, loving. What does that all mean? What did Paul mean then? I find the words of one commentator helpful as we understand the implication of what Paul is really saying here. Listen to these words. Listen carefully. Such a statement from Paul cuts across the grains of any notion of freedom as autonomy and independence, yet it is indispensable for understanding the impact, the full impact of God's reconciling work in Jesus on our human relationships. Paul is clear that Christ frees us from the judgment of the law, fulfills it for everyone, meaning if I am not to be judged by the law, then I am also freed from having to judge others based on the law. Think of the implications, this commentator continues, of what Paul commands. I am free, delivered from having to determine which of those laws matter. I am free, delivered from my own preoccupations about which of those laws my neighbor is breaking. I am free, delivered from the obligation to police my neighbor's behavior. I am free, delivered from the temptation to judge the sinfulness of what my neighbor does, who my neighbor is, and how my neighbor lives. We are all free from the law so that just as slaves served without questioning the legitimacy of their masters, we can focus on serving our neighbors without questioning their legitimacy. We can focus on just loving one another. Hear some of that again, because it's important. If I am not to be judged by the law, then I am also freed from having to judge others based on the law. We are all free from the law, so that just as slaves served without questioning the legitimacy of their masters, we can focus on serving others without questioning their legitimacy. We can focus on just loving one another. Our freedom, then, is not for the pursuit of individual right and personal liberty and self-indulgence and self-interest. Our freedom from being judged by the law, freedom given to us by Jesus' radical and sacrificial service on our behalf, frees us from the responsibility and the temptation of judging others on the law. We don't have to worry about whether someone is worthy or not, someone is sinning or not, someone is deserving or not. We are freed to just love one another, to just serve one another. Because as Paul says, for the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For some of us, this is the best news ever, a true gift. Because not only has God through Jesus enfolded us into this one for everyone born grace by freeing us from the judgment of all those laws, so many laws that we could never truly fulfill or live out, but in the same act, God frees us from the responsibility of having to conduct a litmus test on people before we love them, we serve them, we welcome them, we put a leaf in the family dinner table and offer them bread and cup. This is a gift for some of us. For others of us, this is difficult news. It's a struggle. We might even resist it, adding our own addendums. Maybe because the temptation to judge is so strong. Maybe because the responsibility of judgment is pretty appealing, actually. It makes us feel a bit better about ourselves. Maybe we've listened to other law-bound Christians who've been wearing their sin police badges so long it just seems normal, natural. Or maybe 
Loving and serving others without standards or expectations seems too risky. Whichever one of those you find yourself fitting into. We know that these words of Paul are meant for a people, a church, that felt stuck in between. Words not for us originally, but they speak to us now. Because the Galatian church was not all that different from ours, really. Like the first century church, like Abbey, we can feel stuck. Not in between a cupboard and its door, like that toddler was, but like the church of Galatia in between the impulse to define, determine, judge, and the impulse to use our Christian faith to justify our quest for self-interested personal freedom, self-indulgent individual liberty. But just like Abby's mom reminded her she wasn't actually stuck after all. She just had to let go of the cupboard she was holding on to so tightly. Paul reminded those long ago Christians and us that we aren't actually stuck between two poles either. Jesus has given us a way out, a third way, freedom. Freedom from the law. Freedom from self-indulgent liberty, a third way of no litmus test required love. Paul's conclusion to the letter, it points us to Jesus. Jesus was always putting the extra leaf in God's family dinner table, welcoming the stranger, adding to the family tree. Jesus was an includer with a wide welcome, with one gospel of grace. Jesus was the ultimate example of this kind of love. No litmus test required. Chaplain Becca Stevens writes it this way, of all of Jesus' theology that we try to study and live by, it is this context of love that we see. And the gospel of Jesus shows us how to love one another in real thoughts, in real words, in real deeds. It's a story that is always about how we are freed to do just that. One of my favorite authors, Anne Lamont, she tells a story you may have heard before about this very kind this very kind of no litmus test kind of love. In her book, Traveling Mercies, she writes, one of our newer members, Ken, is dying of AIDS, disintegrating before our very eyes. He came to us a year ago, shortly after his long-term partner, Brandon, died of AIDS. Ken has a totally lopsided face, ravaged and emaciated, but when he smiles, he is radiant. He looks like God's crazy nephew, Phil. He says that he would gladly pay any price for what he has now, which is Jesus and us. One of our choir members, a devout woman named Ranola, has been a little standoffish toward Ken. She looks at him sideways as if She wouldn't have to quite see him if she didn't look at him head on. It's clear she and a few other women in the church have strong opinions, and it's hard for Renola to break through this. I think she and those other women are a little afraid of catching his disease, as if standing too close might be enough. But Ken has come to church almost every week for a year. And then recently he missed a couple of Sundays when he got too weak. And finally, a few weeks ago, he was back, weighing almost no pounds, his face even more lopsided, as if he'd had a stroke. Still, 
During the prayers of the people, he talked joyously of his life, of his decline, of grace, and of how safe and happy he feels these days. And so on this one particular Sunday, for the first hymn, Ken couldn't even stand up. But he sang away loud as he was sitting down the hymnal on his lap. And then, when it came time for the second hymn, what we call the fellowship hymn, we were to sing, His Eye is on the Sparrow. And the pianist was playing, and the whole congregation had risen, and only Ken remained seated, holding the hymnal in his lap. And we began to sing, Why should I feel discouraged? Why do the shadows fall? And I looked on as Renola watched Ken, rather skeptically for a moment, And then her face began to melt and contort like his. And she went to his side and she bent down to him and she lifted him up. She lifted up this white rag doll, this scarecrow, and she held him next to her, draped over her shoulder, against her like a little child while they sang together. And then both Ken and Renola began to cry and tears were pouring down their faces and their noses were running like rivers. But she stood there, she held him up. She suddenly lay her black weeping face against his feverish white one, put her face right up against his and let all those fluids mingle with hers. It was an honest to God miracle, reminding me that we are here to take care of one another. One gospel, one call, one table, one promise, one hope, so that we can all let go of whatever we're holding on to, whatever we're stuck in between for a third way, a way of freedom, a way of love, to one another. All God's people say together, Amen. Please pray with me. God who is bigger and fuller and broader than we can imagine, we praise you. We thank you for the wideness of your love for us. And for the way that that love serves us, became enslaved to sin for us, so that we may be free from the fullness of the law, that we may embrace the fullness of your love. So come to us now, O oh God, in your spirit. Speak the third way into our ears so that we do not hear those competing voices that might surround us Allow us to choose the way of freedom. Freedom. Freedom from litmus test required love. So that we may truly love and serve one another. It's in your name we pray and all God's people say together. Amen. If there is any example of this kind of love, the one that Jesus showed us, serving us in sacrifice. It is this table. This table is a sign, a symbol, a reminder of the love for one another that we are called to have. All are welcome to receive these signs and symbols. Instructions for communion this morning. Uh, Like last month, we will ask you to come forward Uh, And as a reminder, for these three sections of pews, you will exit to your left and come forward to the station, uh, receive bread and also a cup, and take those and then return to your seat. Um, uh, One uh, change this particular month, we only have one gluten-free station, and that will be here far to the... uh, Oh, over there. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. All right, far to the, uh, the east side, so that will be the gluten-free station. If you need gluten-free elements, please make sure that you go through uh, that station. That will be Fran Mullenberg serving there. Uh, also, this section, you get to fill in behind all the other sections. So you may exit uh, and, and fill in behind all of these other um, places. And then you can return to your seats on the right-hand side. Uh, children are welcome 
uh, to come forward. Uh, they're welcome to participate at the discretion of their parents or guardians. Uh, if children do not participate, we still invite them to come forward for a blessing and simply cross their arms over their chest, and then the elder or pastor will uh, pronounce a blessing over them. We pray together using the communion prayer in your bulletins and on the screen with our eyes open as we prepare ourselves to receive this gift of grace. God who creates, redeems, and sustains us as we gather at this table of grace, we remember that Jesus', Jesus body was broken and his blood shed for the reconciliation and healing of every tongue and tribe. By your Spirit, O God, meet us here in these signs and symbols that remind us of your loving gift of grace through Jesus Christ, joining us as one people. As, as we, we share, share in this bread and cup, heal our, our divisions, divisions, unite us as your people, and, and renew our call as witnesses in the world. May this bread nourish us for the work of justice, love, joy, and peace carried out in Christ's name. May this cup be to us a reminder to follow in the way of Jesus who poured his life into a world in need. And as we wait for the fullness of your arrival when all wrongs will be made right, teach, teach us, us to befriend the lonely, to serve, to serve the, the poor, poor, to reconcile with our enemies, and, and to love our neighbors. neighbors. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, we give you glory and praise. And so we pray. Come, come Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus come. come. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In the same manner, also, when they had eaten, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are now ready.
hearts, spirits, bodies full, full to the brim of God's love. We join in hearing these words from the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Before we come to God in the prayers of the people this morning, just a couple of prayer updates that were not included in this week's prayer announcements. First, be in prayer for Phyllis Rensink. Uh, Phyllis is hospitalized at the Orange City Area Health System with COVID. She is making progress, but it's slow, and so please be in prayer for Phyllis and for her recovery. And then also be in prayer for Phyllis DeHaan, who uh, Friday night into Saturday morning uh, suffered a stroke and was airlifted to Sioux Falls to Sanford Hospital. Uh, She had somewhat of a better night last night, and so we pray for her continued recovery and pray for God's hand of healing upon Phyllis and uh, and prayers of blessing for her family as they support her. We join together in response through this prayer. God of love, remind us here and now, hearts full with the signs and symbols of your love for us in Jesus of your one gospel for everyone born grace, one call to share that grace with others, welcoming them to this one table, centered on one promise, pointing to our one hope, so that we can serve one another, love one another well, without getting stuck in between the factions that surround us. Instead, join us with those who in all times and places have given witness to the unity of your church and proclaim your message of love and sacrifice. So just as Jesus prayed that his followers may all be one, so we pray. Pour into us the courage needed to let go of all that doesn't point to or reveal your gospel love in the person of Jesus so that we may work towards healing and reconciling any division that separates us from one another. Pour into us the humility needed to acknowledge any suspicion, hatred, and prejudice that hinders us from seeing the full human dignity of others. Pour into us the love we need to serve one another without seeking to legitimize another's worthiness. May that love overflow with generosity of spirit. Pour into your world the wisdom needed for leaders to work together toward justice for all people. Pour into your world the compassion needed to work toward peace, restoration, and stewardship so that all people may flourish on the earth. Pour into your world the power needed to break the bondage of abuse and the misuse of your life-giving, love-birthing word. Pour into your world what we do not even know to pray for so that those here and everywhere struggling with hunger, addiction, grief, brokenness, illness, and more may know healing, release, comfort, redemption, and love. And may the prayer taught to us by Jesus be our guide as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Elsewhere in the epistles, Paul writes these words, Thanks be to God for the indescribable gift. Each week in American Reformed Church, as we hear God's word proclaimed, we respond to God's word by offering our prayers of the people and then providing an opportunity for us to think carefully about how we're using our our resources to steward them wisely for the mission of God in the world. One of the ways that you might choose to do that would be through your tithes and offerings to American Reformed Church. There's a tithes and offerings lockbox in the back. You can place your gift there every Sunday morning as you enter into worship. You may also give online. You may also mail your gift to the church office. We are so grateful for the way that you respond to God's great generosity to us through your own generosity. And in that spirit and in that light, together we stand to sing the doxology.
We continue our response by singing together, We All Are One in Mission. This, this uh, Sunday we get to sing the whole hymn. Isn't that fun? So we'll sing the three verses and then we'll hear the benediction and then we'll sing the fourth verse as our sending song. Let's sing together. One brief announcement. Um, You won't believe this, but it's time to think about Advent already. That's ah, very scary for a pastor, but probably sounds great to everyone else. Anyway, on the back, we have opportunities for you to sign up that involve signing up and contacting people. So we invite you to just take this home and look over it and see what might apply to you and if you would like to get involved in helping our congregation celebrate the Advent season and Christmas together. Friends, as you go out into the world, you go out one in mission. I invite you to hear these words, to let them ring in your ears. The love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen.